minds. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for days like today that we're able to just gather together in fellowship in this sweet way to study your word, to be washed over by it, to be built up by it. Father, we're just so grateful to you for all your grace, your mercy, your love. We pray for those in the congregation, Father, that aren't here this morning, that you heal them, that you make them right, that you correct them as necessary, bring them back to the fold. Father, we pray for those that are still lost in this world without hope, that they be humbled, repent, receive saving faith before it's too late. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross 2,000 years ago to make times like this a reality for us. We do just ask for blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Part 98, the book of Hebrews. Last week, we had a special that was titled, Perfect Love is Complete, which I've received a lot of feedback on. Um, so it seems that Holy Spirit really knows what he's doing, huh? Right? Now, interestingly, there has to be a balance statement set here because... Um, I suppose it's a good and bad reaction from you all. It seems that most of you were convicted in the negative sense, meaning a message like that convicted you, but you were kind of like a uh, crud, didn't really measure up. The message pointed out maybe a thing or two awry regarding the current state of love in your life. And that's great. Like, I don't have a problem with that. I'm sure God has got a plan. Um, and that is necessary for sanctification. It's good to be convicted of the things that you're not in a spiritual sense. But may I also submit that these messages always have two sides. It's like anything righteous in Holy Scripture. There's always two sides. It's like whenever I teach, uh, you know, uh, God is not mocked. What is it, Galatians 6, 7? God is not mocked. Whatever a man reaps, that he will sow. And people are like, oh, that sounds scary. It's always in a negative sense, but that's, there's two sides to that. If you reap righteousness, you sow righteousness so good. That's the way God operates. Is it's, it's a matter of integrity to his justice and his righteousness. That It's great that you get convicted of where you might be missing the mark, but also you need to be encouraged. So the Spirit wanted me to add this to you, to your souls. Raise your hand. I mean, really, don't just do this thing that, you know, you guys do. Like, raise your hand if you love the Lord. Right? Now keep it raised if you have loved him perfectly. Now why'd you all put your hands down? Now put your hand back up if you love him more than you did when you were still an unbeliever. With the emphasis on more. Okay, that's good. That's progress. And that's something to what? Celebrate. Because you have more of that love in your life than you used to. Oodles more if you think about when you were an unbeliever where you had this much. But even as you're sanctified, you have more today, presumably, than you did, I don't know, yesterday, 
week, month, year ago, 10 years ago? Go to 1 Corinthians 6, 9. So I want you to, or the Spirit wants you to be encouraged as well. Messages like last week, they're fantastic, and they do really put us back on our heels and make sure we are honest with ourselves. But if we're going to be honest, we have to be honest in both directions, right? It's not just about conviction in the negative sense. It's also conviction in the positive sense. Like, we have a lot to celebrate. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And as such, were some of you. In other words, that was your way of life. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's really good news. Ever since you were saved, God has been at work in you. You always have to think about in God's view, God's perspective, he gets what he wants. Right? He never fails. His word never goes out and comes back empty. He always gets what he wants. And what does he want but that which is pleasing to him? So you have to think about God that way. He gets what he wants, and he gets what pleases him. And you, my friends, as children of God, are part of that equation, part of that formula. And so he does things in you that make him happy, that please him. And he never fails. You follow? And you being in the middle of that means that he's never failed with you and he's not going to fail with you, which means there's an awful lot to celebrate. So you have to think about the way God thinks of you even, personally. Ever since you were saved, God has been at work in you for his good pleasure. Don't ever shortchange his grace in your life. And this is, again, a response to what I've seen in many of you regarding last week's messages, that you were convicted, mostly, it seems, in the negative sense. Like, ah, oh, you know, my love isn't complete. My love, I feel inferior. I feel insecure. It's great to be convicted, but convictions go in both directions. Don't ever shortchange his grace in your life. While it's wonderful and telling of your salvation that you listened to and took heart last week's messages, it would be a real tragedy if you forgot all that he's accomplished in you so far. It's all too easy. We are creatures of, I don't know what to call it, but it feels like you can have a, you know, 99 good things going on in your life, and what do you focus on? The one bad thing. Right? That's why people become depressed. They overly, they, I call it over-rotating. They over-rotate on that one thing. Now it's great to understand that there's one thing awry, and if you only have one out of nine out of a hundred, you're lucky, right? This is an example. But we have this habit as human beings to hyper-focus on the one thing that's out of line, instead of the 99 that's in line. So it'd be a real tragedy if you forgot all that he's accomplished in you so far. The simple fact is that if you have even a smidgen of his love in you, just a little bit. It's a full-on miracle. Like, for real. I'm not, I'm not waxing poetic here. I'm not trying to amplify this to make you feel good. Literally, it's a miracle. Because you were completely incapable of that. 
before he saved you. So the fact that you have any love in you, <clears throat> any at all, is a miracle. <laughs> so our first key principle this morning is don't forget the miracles in your life and be grateful to God for them. Don't forget the miracles in your life. They, we tend to like overlook them. Go to Romans 12.4. Romans 12.4. <clears throat> Be grateful to God for them. Romans 12.4. For, Romans 12.4, <clears throat> for as in one body... We have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, <clears throat> are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them if prophecy in proportion to faith. Now, I'm probably going to be writing a blog on this at some point. I know I sent a note on this to myself. Um, two things going on here. Two dimensions to spiritual gifts. One, God decides who gets what, not you. You may think you have this gift. Or you may aspire to have certain gifts, but you just don't have it. And that's okay. But not only that, if you actually have a gift, the proportion of it, the size of it, the, the magnitude of that gift is also a function of God. He decides. So said proportion of spiritual gifts is a function of God's grace. In other words, God decides the extent of our spiritual gifts and it's him alone. Because it's for his good pleasure that he gives grace. It's not for your good pleasure. It's not for your personal aspirations. It's for him. And we collectively have to think about it that way. Right? Like, I have to tell Don all the time. He's always like, I'm such a better deacon than Chris. He's like, look at me. I'm amazing. Chris is like, I say, Don, it's different portions of faith. <laughs> he doesn't say that. You get what I'm saying, though? But if that was actually true, who cares? Like, Don's being the person he needs to be. Chris is being the person he needs to be. We don't compare people like that. It's all a matter of what God decides to give. I can say the same thing about myself. Right? We have a nice church. It's rather regular, maybe even on the small side. Why didn't he give me like a huge ministry? And should I be like, wow, why am I not like John MacArthur or the late R.C. Sproul? Why don't I have thousands of people posting on Facebook about me? Why don't I have that? Why doesn't anybody post about me? That's complete and utter garbage thinking from the pit of hell. Because God's the one who gives gifts. And God's the one who gave me you. Yay. <laughs> right? Do you know what I'm saying? I'm totally happy with it. Like, I'm totally cool with it. That's the way it should be. And if you have a spirit, if you know what your spiritual gifts or gifts, I don't think that it's just one, by the way. Some people prescribe to, subscribe to that thinking it's wrong. Uh, you don't just have one most of the time. Whatever. Like, just be you. Can you just do that for a day? Stop being an American jackass and comparing yourself to every other person that walks by. Is that not the American way? Ladies? Walk into a room, what's the first thing ladies do? Size each other up. Who's the queen? 
Men, same thing. Walk into a room. Who's the king? Who's the alpha? It's ridiculous. Honest to goodness, it's absolute asinine, ridiculous, indicative of the human flesh. And we take that into the spiritual life, and it's a catastrophe. That's not what God wants. God's ways are not our ways. What is, look, he said, if you're faithful in the little things, then I'll grant you in the future. I just want to know if you're faithful or not to whatever I give you. Remember the, like the parable of the miners? Where, you know, any of the parables where he gives some amount to some and some to another. It's not about how much he gives. It's how you use what he gives you. Is that fair? IQ is another example. Some people are really smart. Some people aren't so smart. So? Who gave you your IQ? God did. You should use it to his glory. If you got a huge IQ, then you use it to his glory. If you got a little IQ, then you use it to his glory. But in God's mind, since he's the one who gave you that portion of whatever it is you want to focus, hyper-focus on, then all he's looking for is how do you use what he gave you effectively to his glory. Verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Look, at the end of it, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. One of my absolute favorite characteristics in a person is authenticity. Authenticity. And I wrote a blog this weekend, or this week, called When Christianity Becomes an Excuse. And the analogy I used was a photographic negative. If you've ever, you remember those things? You get back the little thing from, uh, what was it called? Uh, Kodak? Remember the little... They even had those little booths you could drive up to and throw your film in and you get back and you get your pictures, but then behind the pictures in a little pouch is the little photo negatives and you hold them and be like, man, I look creepy in this thing. You know? Cause anybody? No? <laughs> Thanks, Diane. That's because we're old. I mean, you are. I'm, right. That was the analogy that I used, and here's a quote from that blog, <clears throat> when Christianity becomes an excuse. In Christianity, I see this play out, this photo negative thing over and over again where people carve out a personality or project certain characteristics about themselves that are truly disturbing to someone who understands who Christ is and they use holy scripture as the basis of their proclamations but they flip-flopped the meaning often taking scripture out of context to suit their own desires So, when the Bible says, let your love be genuine, that's basically the Bible saying, be authentic. Like, be who you are. Own who you are. And as friends of one another, you do you, and you let me do me. Let everybody be themselves. You worry about being authentic. Homologeo, confess the same thing that God sees in you. That's what you should be focusing on. You don't worry about what, how everybody else is. You might even be disturbing their walk. They might be doing well with their authenticity, beginning to realize the beauty of owning who they are in Christ. And you're disturbing it by saying they should be more or different because they're not measuring up to your standards. Who the hell are you? For real. Be authentic. Again, verse 9. <clears throat> Let love be genuine. 
abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. As the blog stated, don't be a photographic negative of who God desires you to be. Be yourself. Be authentic. Embody God's grace. And only, now listen to me, embody God's grace and only to the degree that he has given it to you. Give that some thought. In other words, don't over-rotate. If he says, look, I've given you this gift, then you say, thank you, Lord. Let me go spend it to your glory. Let me go perform the duty that you've given me with authenticity and vigor and joy. Let me go do that thing. Versus, oh, well, it seems you've got me cleaning toilets at the church. And uh, I thought I was made for better things than that. You've already missed. You've already missed it. Verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, arrogant, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, <clears throat> for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, when you put this into practice, and then you understand that miracles do happen every day. What we just read did not happen before you were saved, at least not in an authentic way. So there was a time you'd never repay evil with good for example. But now you do. Now when faced with certain challenges, it's you that's heaping burning coals on someone else's head. You meet evil with good. And you leave the rest up to God. Again, to our previous principle, look, that in of itself is a miracle. That's a miracle. Because there was a time where you would have just dropped the hockey gloves. Said, it's time for retribution. You don't diss me like that. Don't forget the miracles in your life. And be grateful to God for them. And again, this is a balance statement. It's great that you got convicted last week. But there's always two sides to the conviction. Don't just focus on the negative. Focus on all that God has, has done in your life by grace. It's a miracle. Because you could not do that on your own. One last passage for encouragement's sake. Go to 2 Corinthians 5.14. 2 Corinthians 5.14. I hope you're taking this to heart. Really. Celebrate. Smile. Be happy. Um, life is short. Why would you, you know, just take it. Take the encouragement. Be happy. You know what I mean? You ever, you ever get like, like, there's days, I go weeks, months. I just went through six months where I felt like I didn't deserve to be happy. It was weird to say that. Like, I just felt crabby. And I felt like I, I in so many ways, needed to be crabby or something. 
I don't know. No, no, not like some cat. You guys are looking at me like, what's wrong with this guy? I didn't have some weird break or anything. I'm just saying, like there was something always tugging on me. Like, you can't be too happy because. Right? And that was just me listening to the kingdom of darkness. You can't be too happy, Ed. Because, and I'll keep that to myself. And he's since delivered me. He said, have, look, love. You're here. You're breathing. Just love. Let love flow out of you. Imagine that. Try that on for size. Put on, in duo. Put on love, says Holy Scripture. Put on Jesus Christ. Those are the same thing. Let your love be genuine. Be authentic in that love. If you're going to put it on, put it on, buster. Put it on. And be okay with being happy. Be okay with what it does for you. That brings glory to God. God is pleased. That's a miracle. And some of you know exactly what I'm saying because without any of that, you are miserable. Second Corinthians 5.14 For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. In other words, put that dead thing away. And he died for all, and that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. There's some good news. There's a miracle for you. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Is that not encouraging? That you're a new creation? The old has passed away? Behold, the new has come? Be encouraged. Like, be okay with it. Celebrate it. Be okay. It's okay. I, I lied a little, though. One more passage. I'm going to grab a little more encouragement before we head on back to our primary course of study in Hebrews. As we read the psalmist's words, think about how God has transformed you personally. Make it very personal. Think about how God has transformed you personally over the years. And I'm just going to read this with you. But let this word, this word of encouragement, wash over you. As you're reading, you say, yeah, that's me. Not perfect, but that's me. That's what my heart wants. That's what the new creature is hungry for, is thirsty for. Go to Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verse 1. When you start thinking like that, you live a life of gratitude. And that is a transcendent way to live. Because there's nothing in this world that can steal or rob that gratitude from you. There's nothing on earth here that can contend with the love of Christ. Right? And that's wonderful. Psalm 118.1 So you live a, uh, a life of gratitude. Psalm 118.1 Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say His steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall, I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. 
In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray. O Lord, O Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festival festival sacrifice with cords. Up to the thorns or the horns of the altar, you are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Now, I think it's safe to say that you love Psalm 118 because you understand God's love and that it's only possible that you understand his love if he's given you a portion of it. You have to, in other words, be in the same sphere as him to understand that kind of love. And so he's brought you closer and closer experientially over time. And that's something to celebrate. So don't just take last week and harp on yourself. It's great evaluation, great analysis, necessary. But never, ever cut yourself off from the beautiful things that have already transpired in your life. So celebrate and be okay with celebrating. Some of you are way too hard on yourselves, like way too hard. And before you know it, you're old, and the stress of being that hard on yourself has taken its toll on you, your spirit, your body, your family, loved ones. It's cancerous. You have to learn how to live to rejoice as well. So celebrate. God has worked a miracle in your life. Please don't let last week's beautiful messages only affect you in the negative sense because there's a lot to celebrate. Amen? All right, don't forget it. All right. So we've got to get back to uh, where we were two weeks ago in our primary course of study. In Hebrews, go to Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Recall our quote from William Lane. Those who remain insensitive to the voice of God in Scripture may discover that God's word is also a lethal weapon. So that brings to bear the power of God's word. The fact that it can cut in any direction it feels like. And that's God. In other words, God and his word are inextricably tied one to the other. You might rightly go so far as to say, based on John 1, 1, that he is the Word. 
think about Holy Scripture and the Word and God, they're essentially the same. The same Word that said in Romans 12, 19, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So if his word is a lethal weapon, as Lane mentioned, then it's okay. Hand it over to the Lord. It's like you don't worry about repaying evil for evil. You repay evil with what? With good. And you leave the wrath up to God. I've taught this a bazillion times already. That sets you free. Now you don't have to worry about concocting some plan for revenge which takes a lot of time and energy and is fruitless in the first place. You just let that over to God. You say, you know what? I'm just going to be good. I'm going to meet this evil with good. And it may just heap burning coals on that person's head, but that's between them and the Lord. But my motivation is not for revenge. I'm going to hand that over. Verse 13, with that in mind, let's read 13. And no creature is hidden from his sight. The word just cuts right to the bone. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So we have a mediator, someone working diligently on our behalf in heaven. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As the Spirit stated last time, Verse 16 is the punchline, if you want to call it that, of this chapter. Sort of the crescendo, right? The, the conclusion, if you would. And we noted a tension that the writer established in this passage that culminates in this exhortation here. This tension is the result of an unsolvable problem, let's call it. An unsolvable problem that is, as we've studied in detail, where grace comes in. You can't solve this on your own. You can't usher yourself into a place of rest. You can't disobey God by refusing His grace and expect to be delivered. So if you just look at yourself and your own abilities, you have what you would call an unsolvable problem. I have these problems, and there's no way I can solve them on my own. And that's a good tension to have. And sometimes, even as believers, we get to that point and we're like, why am I so miserable? Because you've been trying to solve your own problems. And when you just focus on yourself, that's an unsolvable problem. You, you, those problems are still there. But they are completely and utterly unsolvable if you keep trying to roll that rock up a hill yourself. So enter grace. This is where grace comes in. When we get to that point and we go, oh, that's right. Duh. I've been going at this alone. And the crazy thing is, the beautiful thing is, that we have Jesus as our example. We are to do as he did in his time of need. He prayed for grace. That's what Jesus depended on. The grace of his father. He said, Dad, this is your plan. It got so bad, he said, you remember in the garden when there was blood coming out of his skin, if 
Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me. This is uh, it's unbearable what I'm about to go through. He was like right up. He said, I need you. I need your grace. I need your strength. I need your assurance. Verse 16. We're supposed to do what Christ himself did. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I always think about Peter. You going to leave me too, Peter? Lord, where else am I going to go? We should just ask ourselves that. Where else are you going to go in time of need, honestly? I mean, you've already proven it to yourself a thousand times over, if not more, that you can't help yourself. You cannot conquer sin on your own, like some people think they can. We're all addicted to sin. <laughs> if you're an alcoholic, you don't go to a bar. If you're a drug addict, you don't go down to the street corner and hang out with the drug dealers. It's not something you do. You know why? Because you're too weak. Like that, we're addicted to sin. We need him. You cannot overcome sin on your own. It's way too strong. So we go to the one place where we can depend on the power of God to deliver us from that thing that we can't deliver ourselves from. We go to the throne of grace on our knees and say, I don't know how you're going to solve this, Lord but this is your problem. These are your promises. So you've taken on this yourself and told me as much that this is your problem to sanctify me. It's not my problem to sanctify myself. So you do the work, Lord. That's not being arrogant or cocky or disrespectful. That's actually being respectful. That's actually surrendering to the one person who can help. It's not the one in the mirror. So to this writer's audience, approaching the throne of grace, remember, was tantamount to approaching God himself. Human beings are incapable of solving salvific issues. If they were capable, then God would be a liar. And I was thinking about that. That's the great lie from Satan in the kingdom of darkness. And I hope you, you're catching it. The great lie is that man can solve his own problems if he just tries hard enough. As in, you know, put in the work. Put yourself on some self-help program. If you just push a little harder, if you just try a little harder, you too will be delivered. The cold hard truth is that no man, not even Jesus, solved salvific issues without God's grace. Now just think about that for a moment. If the perfect human, Jesus, conceded he needed his Father's grace to succeed, what does that say about your condition? What does it say about you? Matt, uh, Mark 10, 27, Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. So let's take, take a step back for a moment. Let me take this time to remind you all of this book that we've been reading, this beautiful book, the book of Hebrews, which is about salvation. Every book technically is in the Bible, if you get right down to it. The whole thing is just the good news about God's salvation. 
you haven't figured that out yet, keep reading. The craziest thing happens. The more you learn about the Bible, the simpler it gets. Completely opposite of the direction that some take it. But, anyways, this book is no different. It's about salvation, which means that everything this writer wrote relates to salvation proper, even. All the Old Testament references, like Jesus as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. References to the disobedience of Israel, the so-called Hall of Fame of Faith in you know, chapter 11, and so on. Those are just levers. Those are just tools that any good teacher uses to build up his congregation. He just uses these levers to make crisp points to his audience regarding Saving grace. That's what he's trying to get to. And I hope you see the big picture. This book is about salvation. So this writer's fear is primitive. It, it may seem lofty, but that's only because some of the nuances and some of the references he uses, you have to have a little bit of background, say in Old Testament Scripture, uh, Jewish culture, you know, culture that existed 2,000 years ago. So it seems a little nuanced, and you're kind of like, well, it doesn't seem that primitive. But it really is. It's very primitive, what he's actually saying here. It's a, it's a pastor who's, who fears for the lives of those he's teaching. It's a real fear. It's primitive. It has everything to do with salvation. So he's revealed the same base desire that God has. Hold your thumb, go to Ezekiel 33.11. Ezekiel 33.11. Same basic desire. Ezekiel 33.11. Ezekiel 33.11. Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God's not like some... I don't know what you call it, sadist, or what? I don't know what you'd call him. But he's not some maniac that gets off on torturing people and sending people to hell. Uh-uh. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. That's a picture of repentance. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O household Israel? Again, the big picture regarding the book of Hebrews is that the writer wrote about salvation. And that was his primary topic in the end goal of his sermon. For those not yet saved, he was fighting for them. In a sense, pleading, do not apostatize. Don't leave the faith. And for those already saved, presumably most of his audience, he was encouraging them under duress, all in the name of salvation. So often we are encouraged by the simple fact that we're saved. That's the good news of the gospel. It keeps on giving. It's like, wait a minute, time out, wait a minute. Why am I in a funk? I'm saved. God loved me enough to save me. That should wash, that should make everything else in life white noise. Everything else is just something we have to deal with. Puts everything in perspective. And so the writer, like the Lord, 
and Ezekiel 33, 11, didn't want to see anyone make the most catastrophic mistake they could ever make, which is to disobey the gospel command to believe. I hope you see that. All right, go back to Hebrews 4, 16. Hebrews 4, 16, when we get to this crescendo, so to speak, this punchline, Hebrews 4, 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. All this stuff going on, all this pressure under, go to God. Go to God. In salvation, it's always by the grace of God. We are saved daily, remember? We believers, being saved daily, it's also always by the grace of God. Right? Like Paul wrote, oh, you started by the Spirit, now you're going to perfect yourself by the flesh? That is a huge mistake a lot of believers make. They say, well, I'm saved. I guess it's up to me from here on out. I got my ticket right here. I guess I'm on my own. No! That's just the starting point. You were saved by grace. You are saved daily also by grace. We must surrender to the basic premise that to live in any way that is glorifying to God is to live by grace alone. That ties back to the earlier principle I stated, that this is God's job. This is what pleases Him. It's why He reveals grace to us in the first place. Because everything He does is pleasing to Himself. That's His desire. Is everything is for His good pleasure. To live in any way that is glorifying to God is to live by grace alone. That's a really big statement I just made. I'll repeat it. We must surrender to the basic premise that to live in any way that is glorifying to God is to live by grace alone. And this was Paul's sentiment also. Hold your thumb. Go to 1 Corinthians 15.9. 1 Corinthians 15.9. 1 Corinthians 15.9. Paul said, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Hmm. You might say, man, that guy was... Paul was special. Yeah. He ain't better than you given that God gives a portion of faith the way he wills? Can you look at Paul and say, oh my, he's just way up here and I'm just way down here? No. No. I just taught you that. We don't look at other people in the faith that way. Paul didn't even look himself at himself that way. That's the whole point. Is there a certain greatness? Yeah. But is it for comparative purposes? Not at all. You know what's great to me? That you're here this morning. That literally, some of you, a few, not that long ago, couldn't be here because you were stuck somewhere. Maybe in a prison cell even. Maybe it wasn't a physical prison cell. Maybe it was the prison cell between your two ears. Maybe you were so stuck somewhere that you couldn't get out of it. And by the grace of God, here you are. 
That's awesome. Right? And Paul was present, doing what he needed to do when he wrote his epistles. And that's awesome too. That was God's calling. Remember God said early on in Paul's life, I have plans for this guy. He said it to Simon, right? I have plans for this guy. Big plans. And he didn't, he might not have said that about everybody. Some of you are like, well, thank God, because Paul's plans were horrific. People were trying to kill him. He had to walk hundreds and hundreds of miles. He had a horrific life. Anyway. As I've taught in the past, do not pervert Paul's famous words, by the grace of God I am what I am, as some have. He is not saying that by the grace of God you're a sinner and your sins are okay since God ordained their existence. That is a complete perversion that people say tongue-in-cheek but also as a form of uh, doing what they feel like doing, I guess, in sin and they account for their sinfulness that way. Don't do that. That's grotesque. That is not what he's saying here. He's saying anything good about me is by the grace of God. This isn't some weird excuse, like the, like the blog this week. This isn't some weird excuse to let you off to, to, so you can live sinfully. Oh, I am what I am by the grace of God. Tip them back on you. No, don't do that. What Paul was saying is what I'm saying this morning, which is what the Bible is telling us. We must surrender to the basic premise that to live in any way that is glorifying to God is to live by grace alone. God gives grace for a reason, to glorify himself. Does he give it to everyone the same? Not even close. And that's okay, because who? what is grace if it's not his to give? Are you okay with that? Or do you, somewhere in that little soul of yours, you go, that's not fair. That little twi- mm, mm, I, don't, mm, I don't like it. I like the cookie jar better, where everybody can just stick their greedy hands in whenever they feel like it. Go down the street to some giant church where they're preaching some false gospel. That's where you'll find the cookie jar. You're not going to find it here. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us very plainly that God gives grace to whom he wants to. And how he wants to. And when he wants to. In what proportion he wants to. Amen? And that's the end of it. Keep your little fairness crap to yourself. Squash it out. Extinguish it. The Bible clearly teaches he gives grace to some That even ends in salvation, and he doesn't give it to others. Go to Romans 9.22. Romans 9.22. He doesn't give it to everyone. Romans 9.22. What if God... Desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. In other words, God knew they were going to be destroyed even from eternity past in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory. That's a rhetorical question. In other words, what if that's, and this is, what if that's what God really is doing here? And it is, by the way. Does he not have the right to do that? Yeah, that's the whole point. Grace is his to give in his alone. We cannot demand grace. We cannot demand mercy. We like that idea. Some wrap it in a little thing called and I'll call it contemporary free will, because that gets to be the whole hornet's nest. Some perversion they call, quote, free will. 
And it causes all kinds of problems in the church. And it robs God of glory. All I can tell you is this, again, we must surrender to the basic premise that to live in any way that is glorifying to God is to live by grace alone. In other words, like an all-in statement I'm making here. And it's 100% appropriate. As a disclaimer, of course, you'll never, while here on earth, achieve perfect surrender to God's grace. Nonetheless, this is the direction God set you in. When he saved you, your new heart's desire is to be all in, as you will be ultimately in heaven. And let's face it, you know deep in your soul, if you're a child of God, because God put it there, you know deep in your soul that grace is the only way to please God. It's the only way to please God. And that's why he gives it to you. Because he likes to please himself. You get the point? It's not because, I know, I know some of you are going to be like, oh, no way! It's not because there's something special about you. Just like it's salvation proper, the same goes for sanctification in time. It's all by the, God, uh, by the grace of God to His glory. This, my friends, is the reason why the writer wrote what he wrote 2,000 years ago. Look, it's not about you. I know. News break. It's not, certainly not what we're taught in this society we live in. This society tells us it's all about us. From a very young age, that's what we're taught. It's all about us. It's always competitive. There's always sort of this notion of getting ahead, of being at least a little better than the next person. And all the focus when you get there is on how hard you worked. And all the idols that we hold up, what do they say? Ah, you know, you too can have a dream. You just got to work hard. It's all about the creature. It's all about celebrating the creature and the creature's glory and the, the work that the creature put in to get to said place of glory. It's all focused about on the individual without any help from God. And we elevate those people up to the highest orders of our society and say, now that person has made it. They're a billionaire. They have made it. And for the record, you can be a billionaire and be saved. Don't, get, don't do that weird photo negative thing. I see people do that all the time, too. Well, I'm an ascetic because, you know, God said don't lay up treasures for myself. You're an idiot. We'll talk after class if you have a problem with that. There are people in this room that do that crap, and it drives me berserk. You can be a multi-multi-billionaire and be a wonderful, saved person by grace. I'm talking about the other people. I'm talking about the people who have no relationship with Christ and the rest of the world holds them up as if what they did in the absence of the grace of God is something to behold. They didn't even need God. You see that? It can, it can be done without God. This person is up there saying, I made my billions. I'm this wonderful person that everybody holds up. And I'm an agnostic. I'm an atheist. I mean, why do I need God? Look at my life. I'm winning. And everybody's like, yeah. Apparently you don't need God. You can just bring glory to yourself. That is literally antichrist thinking. Like, literally, the exact opposite. The photo negative. So this is why the reason, this is the reason. It's all by the grace of God to his glory. This is why this writer wrote what he wrote. 2,000 years ago. Doesn't matter when. Verse 16. We still there? Hebrews 4.16.
Hebrews 4, 16. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, because there's no way we're going to do this on our own. You will be persecuted, but you don't turn to self. You turn to him, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We are what we are by the grace of God. And in my notes I have, thank God for that. I'll say it again. We are what we are by the grace of God. And thank God for that. We build on rock or we build on sand. And when the storm comes, the one on the rock remain. Thank God for that. The one who builds it on sand, guess what happens? I don't want my life to be built on sand. I don't want my life to be built on something fallible like self-confidence or self-justification or, or being a self-made man. I don't want to be held up by a bunch of morons in this world so I can say, I'm a self-made man. I got here on my own, so can you. I don't want to be that guy because that house comes crashing down. There's no future in that. There's no hope in that. We are what we are by the grace of God. Thank God for that. Amen? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here as family this morning. Thank you for truth that sets us free. We just ask your blessings as we take the things we've learned back to the privacy of our own souls, our families. And your will be done, Father, out to a world that needs it so desperately. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Thank you.